Good morning and a very warm welcome to Conference Conversations, an interactive online talk show where we meet regularly to discuss the key issues and questions related to the work on the Conference of the Future, on the Future of Europe. These conversations are organised under the auspices of the Conference Observatory, a joint initiative by the Bertelsmann Stiftung, the European Policy Centre, the King Baudouin Foundation and the Stiftung Mercator, which aims to observe, critically analyse and inspire the deliberations of the conference and develop its own proposals to improve the EU's future participatory and democratic architecture. I'm Jackie Davis. As always, I have the privilege of moderating our entirely interactive discussion today. And we have just had those first meetings of the citizens panels. We're going to hear more about that in just a moment. And today we want to really use that as an opportunity to reflect on the potential political ramifications of the conference. What impact could it have on the future of European democracy? Uh, and how do we ensure that it has that impact uh, in the longer term? With me today to discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome the co-chairs of the High Level Advisory Group of the Conference Observatory, Herman van Brompuy, who is, of course, President Emeritus of the European Council and President of the European Policy Centre, and Bridget Lafan, Emeritus Professor at the European University Institute. Also from the observatory team, we have with us Yanis Emanulidis, Director of Studies at the EPC, and Dominique Kielemann, Senior Expert at the Bertelsmann Stiftung. A good morning and a very warm welcome to you all. Quick bit of housekeeping before we get underway. As I said, as always, totally interactive discussion. There'll be questions from me to our panel, and then I hope all also from all of you. You are all muted for now. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, the Q&A tab, and please keep your questions brief, or you can click on the raise hand button. And When the time comes, I will allow you to talk. You can use the chat box if you need any help, you have any IT issues, and our wizard team behind the scenes will try to help you. And last but not least, if you would like to tweet out about what you are hearing, please use the hashtag Conference conversations. You can also add Future of Europe or COFOE, but conference conversations is the one we really want you to use. So let's start with a quick update on where we are. The conference co chair, Eva Hofstadt, tweeted after the first citizens panel refreshing ideas, remarkable enthusiasm. It's working. Dominic, is it? How did it go? You were observing those first citizens panels last weekend, focusing on precisely the issue we're discussing today democracy, values, and so on. Uh, how did it go? What have we learned? Well, I think the, the conference on the future of Europe has started already multiple times. But for me, this week and then the week before, that was the real starting point. That was when the European citizens finally came, came into the picture, came into play. And uh, so it is also a chance to look with fresh eyes uh, at a process that was mirrored in endless discussions so, so far. So my personal impression is, so there was a lot of enthusiasm, of course, uh, up to 200 citizens from all over Europe came to Strasbourg, uh, spent three days in the European Parliament. And of course, it was a pretty uplifting experience uh, for all of them and seeing them uh, speaking all in their own mother tongue, working together in smaller groups and bigger groups, discussing, struggling, finding common ground. Uh, is, is something emotional even to witness that uh, and it is all it is also very symbolic but of course it shouldn't be just about symbols uh, and we should be careful of course with inflating this process too much with pathos because at the end of the day we need to see some uh, some results what did we learn what did we see um, from a deliberation, from a participation process perspective, I would say the process works. Yeah. Uh, a politician that is closely involved uh, in the discussions on the conference said, well, at least this part of the process, this part of the conference seems to work. And I would say, yes, so that works technically, it worked logistically. You could tweak a couple of things, but overall, I'm pretty sure that citizens will come up with results. But personally, I must also say I haven't met a single journalist um, in, in Parliament uh, and uh, the, overall the citizens' panels are still left a little bit, little bit in the dark and that needs to change. Okay, we'll come back to that in our discussion later on. And very much echoing your analysis, a paper this week uh, from Johannes Groebel and Karina Stratelat, an observatory paper looking in more detail at what happened at that first 
round two weeks ago, two weekends ago, uh, and coming very much to similar conclusions. It's good. It was uplifting. But there are some tweaks that could be made. Thank you, Dominic. Yanis, in terms of where we go from here, we're only halfway through that first round of citizens panels, aren't we? There's more to go. What happens at the other two and what happens after that? Well, first of all, there are three rounds overall of uh, all four European citizens panels. So we have the first two sessions of the first two European citizens panels, uh, two remaining of these uh, this first round. Then there will be um, meetings, the second session online. So all those citizens which uh, Dominic was, talk were ta was talking about will meet for a second time, but this time online. And then there's a final third round, um, which will be again in person, uh, but this time not in Strasbourg, but in Florence, uh, Natalie in, in, in Belfast and in Maastricht, where they will come together for the third and final round of, of meetings and to come up with recommendations. And um, to put a more complex story short, these recommendations are then being discussed in a conference plenary in December and in another conference plenary in January. Uh, and following these discussions, we get to the final phase, to the hot phase uh, of the conference, where the question then comes up, which already Dominic was indicating, what happens to the proposals which come up, came out of the uh, citizens' deliberations, uh, where you get into the hot phase, where actually the proposals need to be prepared um, in view of the final report, where we will again have uh, a conference plenary meetings, at least one, maybe even two, in February slash March. Okay, thank you very much. And the big question, of course, everyone keeps asking is, to what extent will the outcomes of these citizens panel, Dominic said very confident they will generate the ideas, the proposals, the big $64 million question keeps being what happens to their input. Uh, but Herman, Bridget, very warm welcome. Thank you for being with us. Let's zoom out a bit, if we might, uh, from the detail of where we are in the process to what all this might mean. And Herman, if I could start with you. Uh, in terms of how do you see the conference and its place within this broader debate at the moment that we're having within Europe about the state of democracy, the future of democracy, a lot of concerns, uh, is do you believe the conference can be part of an answer and how great are your concerns about the state of democracy now? Thank you, Jackie. Um, let's say that... Um, Democracy should be at the heart of, of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So you can discuss many issues and many things, uh, but for me, the focus should be on the functioning of democracy at a European level and in the member states. So you have the European democracy as such, and you have the democracy in Europe. And there's much more than just playing with words. Um, and ask, you ask me what my assessment is. Yes, I'm worried, as many others are, uh, are worried. Uh, because, and we see it not only in Europe, we see it also in the United States. Democracy is not, so, not considered anymore unanimously as a value. There are a lot of people, also young people, older people, of course, but also young people. Uh, who are looking at democracy as more as an added value? What, uh, what are the deliverables? What are the results? Uh, uh, but not so much as a value uh, in itself. And, and that's, of course, that, that, that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous. Uh, so we have to, to counter this with, with all means. Uh, and, of course, in the European Union, we have to... Uh, two big worries. The first is what happens in some of our countries um, with uh, the freedom of media, with the freedom of speech, the independence of judiciary, and so on. We are the self-declared fatherland of democracy, the European Union, but we have problems inside uh, the European Union. So uh, we have to correct this. There is now a reaction from the European Parliament, from the European Commission, uh, from the European Council. There was a big, big discussion uh, on, uh, on LGTB rights uh, in the European Council a few, a few weeks ago. So that there is a, a rising awareness uh, and, and the readiness to take action. And of course, we have uh, the, still the danger of populism. Huh? Um, what, what will happen in some of our member states? Huh? When I look at the opinion polls in, in Italy, 
the two, two populist parties are close to a majority, uh, and that is the third country in the European Union. And, and, and a populist is, is using democracy to get power, but once they have power, they try to get rid of mm -hmm. some democratic values. So there is, a, there is still a lot of uh, reason of reason to be to be concerned, and and uh, the, the the conference of the on the future of Europe should focus on that issue, the future of democracy. Thank you, and very striking as you say, making that link between the discussion on values, the discussion on rule of law, and that's precisely what they did last weekend in putting those issues together to be discussed by the conference. We'll come back on that focus uh, in a little while, but Bridget, the broader context, Herman, there outlining the reasons we have to be worried, to be concerned about the state of democracy now. Do you share those concerns and do you see a, a real role for the conference in addressing them? So let me begin by zooming out and focusing on what I would call the inflection point or transformation that we have in what I call the infrastructure of politics. We live in a period where those classical institutions, political parties are changing. We have a lot of fragmentation, challenger parties from the left and from the right. So the infrastructure of politics is changing. I would also say that we face more fragmentation in terms of the political space we just saw the German uh, the German election but also there are very fundamental underlying societal shifts and whenever you get major societal shifts you get major shifts in politics and by definition in democracy and there I point to both the rise of identity politics changing political economy the nature of work so ours and of course the other important variable is the change in communications the communications revolution social media, non-stop news. So when we look at democracy and politics today, we are in a period of, uh, of profound change. And whenever that happens, uh, democracy itself is buffeted. Uh, it has to adjust and adapt. Now, the good news, and there is good news, at least in Europe. What's the good news in Europe? Empirically from the European Value Survey, we know, in fact, that most Europeans share a common conception of democracy and most want to live in a democracy. I accept what Herman said about some people now looking to authoritarian solutions, but the vast majority of Europeans hold fast to democracy, and for them, democracy means broadly similar things. And this is very good news. I think the United States is somewhat different. But where there are differences is the performance of democracy. So by and large, the people of Northwestern Europe are more or less content, either fairly satisfied or very satisfied with democracy. The eastern half of the continent, it's a third less. So many, many more people in the eastern half of the continent, less satisfied with the actual performance of democracy. And then thirdly, the southern half of the continent, where the Great Recession really buffeted the democracies and politics of the southern, of, of the Mediterranean countries. So performance does performance does matter. But the good news is that most Europeans still believe in democracy. And I think that's not just believe in it, but have a common concept of what democracy is. But of course, because of those deep structural shifts I spoke about, democracy and politics will have to change to adjust both to govern more complex societies, but also we live in societies where a remarkable feature of the German election was how little debate there was about both foreign policy and EU policy. And yet the future of Germany will be as much determined by what happens in the outside world as within the Federal Republic Absolutely. itself. So there's a mismatch between the, the, the problems and issues that are there to be addressed and then the, the continuing dominance of domestic politics. So my hope for the Conference on the Future of Europe is that it accelerates and accentuates what I call the transnational element of how we govern and live in Europe today. Thank you very much indeed. And can I just ask, I mean, Herman drew that distinction, we're talking about European democracy, and we also talk a lot uh, about, and since I've uh, been in Brussels uh, over 30 years, about the democratic deficit at EU 
in the EU and the way the EU is governed. Just to follow up, Bridget, do you think we really have a democratic deficit in the EU or has this become a bit of a buzzword for a sense of remoteness of, from Brussels to, to the member states? Uh, do we, and is it, if we do, is it getting worse? Same question to you and to Herman and then I'll bring in Dominic and Yanis. So on the democratic deficit, I think I would broadly like to ditch the deficit. In other words, that the conceptualization of the democratic deficit is uh, not that helpful in, in addressing these issues. Why do I say that? It really does depend on your benchmarks. So if you look at the EU from the nation state up, then clearly democracy is thinner, the scale is different, the institutions are more distant, all of that. But if you look at the EU from the global down, then there is no other place in the world with a European Parliament that has MEPs from Finland to, to the Atlantic coasts of Portugal. And also there is an emerging transnational politics in Europe. But we have to begin, I think, from the benchmark that democracy in the EU, and I'm not talking about democracy in Europe now, will always be thinner than what we have come to understand as democracy at national level. It will be thinner because of scale, it will be thinner because of complex identity, and it will be thinner because of this compound political community that is Europe. So it, for me, it depends, on, uh, it depends on benchmarks. And I think a lot of academic analysis sees the EU as a scaled up version of a nation state. It can right. never be that. Yeah. So, so Herman, not that useful when talking about the contribution the conference could make uh, to addressing these, these issues uh, related to democracy. Not that useful to keep talking about the deficit. Would you? You've been at the heart of EU decision making. Did you feel you were at the heart of something that was that suffered from such a deficit or not? Just one word about the first intervention of uh, uh, Brigitte. Uh, People are voting, are saying that they are favoring of, of democracy. Of course, huh? if you ask people, are you in favor of, the, of dictatorship? They don't. They don't say they are in favor of dictatorship. The strange thing is, paradoxical thing is, that although they are very much in favor of political democracy, they are voting in some countries close to uh, to uh, 40, 50 percent. To they are voting for anti-democratic parties. Mm. So that is not a consistent behavior. Uh, and talking about uh, the North and the South, there are differences. But for instance, a country as France, in the next presidential elections, um, most likely the candidate of the far right will have 40 or 45 percent of the votes, 40 or 45 percent of the votes uh, for a very, very well known uh, populist and sometimes a, even extremist uh, uh, party. So we, we have to look at the, all the paradoxes and inconsistencies in, uh, let's say, the, the way people are expressing uh, their, uh, their, uh, their opinion. A democratic deficit in the European Union, I fully agree with Bridget. Uh, you cannot compare the European democracy or the democracy at the EU level with the national democracies. It will always be different. Uh, if we have no satisfying explanation, we say it is uh, very specific or, or ad hoc, and because we have no other words for that. Uh, but my, my uh, and, and constitutionally wise, uh, there is no democratic deficit. We have a double legitimacy, uh, one uh, according to national democracies represented by the nation states uh, and, and the, the council of ministers, one branch of the legislative party pa uh, uh, power. And we have the Euro uh, European parliament directly elected with a strong European legitimacy. So it, it, it will always be complicated. But broadly speaking, uh, if people feel that they are sufficiently represented by, by the, those who are elected. Uh, people, if you ask the question, if, if they feel that democracy is delivering, as yeah. Bridget said, uh, then, then, then you find a democratic deficit at all levels of power. Uh, for, for sure at the European level, but also at the national level. The roots of populism are not Europe. 
European ones. The roots of populism are national ones. And you have even a democratic deficit uh, at the local and, uh, and regional uh, level. And so you know, we have all over the place, uh, you have this feeling that democracy should function better and deliver, deliver better. But, but thank you very much. So, Yanis, I mean, not um, both Bridget and Herman saying not useful really to identify, if I can extrapolate from that, the conference as an answer to an EU democratic deficit. That's not what it should is about. Uh, but it is, I mean, Herman said to make sure the functioning of democracy. Uh, he said he wanted to focus on that. Uh, Bridget wanted to focus on the transnational element. Would you agree with them that talk of a democratic deficit is easy, it's simple, it's been around for as long as I said earlier as I've been in Brussels, but isn't quite shooting at the right target here. Well, I think, first of all, I would agree that we take this step back. And also when you look at the Conference on the Future of Europe in the context of the democracy discourse, that we take it a step back and that we ask ourselves, what is the problem? And the problem is, or the challenge is bigger than the conference and is prob it's bigger than democracy at the European level. We're talking about challenges related to democracy at all levels of governance in Europe, but also beyond Europe. So there are challenges to democracy, which we need to address. Um, Bridget was talking about democracy at European level not becoming like they are at the national level and that we will have thinner democracy. But I would say, yes, we will have thinner democracy at the European level, but we need thicker democracy at the European level, uh, even if it will not reach the same level as we know from that from, from member states, for example. Um, so we have a fundamental challenge with respect to the future of democracy. But again, that's not new. Democracy has been evolving over time. You know? as, um, as Bridget, you were referring to, there are major societal changes which are happening, also technological changes which are happening, which require democracy to be adapted to new realities. And the same has to happen now. And it has to happen at the different levels uh, of democratic governance, whether it is from, you know, from the local uh, to the national, to the, to the supranational. Um, that, so and that also needs to be done at the, national, at the European level. And, and that I think is, there I think is what, where the conference can play a role, the conference in itself as a process. Now, I'm not saying that the way in which we are now conducting the Conference on the Future of Europe is a perfect process. It is by no means a perfect process, but it is adding another element to something which we haven't had. And so we need to further develop that part of our democratic system at the European level, where the conference is now playing a role and future conferences, hopefully they will be called differently, could also potentially play a role. Uh, just one last point, because I think the conference on the future of Europe, as I said in the beginning, also relates to democracy, that's clear as a process, but it is also relates to, to democracy uh, in terms of the ability of the European to deliver, to deliver mm -hmm. when it comes to policy concerns which people have, um, especially the major, the bigger, the fundamental challenges which we're all facing in terms of the transformations which we're seeing happening in front of, of, of our eyes. Um, and here the conference, I think, can provide an added value. It can also provide an added value when it comes to issues of uh, institutional governance concerns at the European level, where we can ask ourselves as to whether one can complement the current uh, participants to participatory democracy at European level by introducing new elements, by changing the governance uh, of the European okay. Union. So I think it's multidimensional how the conference can influence the process, but also the output of democracy. Thank you. Dominic, your reaction to what you've heard, uh, particularly in relation to this question of the democratic deficit or lack thereof, uh, and the role that you see for the conference here. Yeah, just quickly, perhaps a rather practical thought. I mean, I want to get back to Herman's earlier distinction between democracy in Europe, in member states, and democracy at the EU level. I mean, when we look at member states, and Bridget, Herman have described it very well, so we see some backsliding, which was described in the book, how democracies die, yeah, they, they gradually can slide into authoritarianism and all that sort of thing. So now looking at the EU, I mean, if you say there would be a sole autocrat in the EU, yeah, you would rather get a good laugh. Yeah. So that's just not going to happen. So it is quite actually quite a democratic system. So where is the problem? The problem is how with it is EU democracy, how alive and kicking is it, how close to its citizens is, uh, is it? So these are the questions. How do we bring in European citizens into the decision-making process? So far, 
for the last decades, we've always heard also from the EU institutions, we've got to bring the EU closer to its citizens. Now it goes the other way around, of course, how can we bring in uh, the EU citizens closer into the decision making process? And here I believe the, the conference has a role to play. So first, of course, as a, as a new tool that allows for fundamental discussions on the future of EU and EU democracy, and the question how to protect EU democracy as a whole in member states in the EU is a, is a more than just a relevant question. And second, uh, I think, of course, the, the conference is interesting because um, the EU has, has struggled to come up with a new model for reform. So there is no idea how in future treaties could be changed. So it is very hard to think about a situation where treaties actually could be changed. And here, I do not think that, that the conference delivers any result. Of course not. But the conference might give an idea how this could perhaps be done uh, in the future. Thank you. Just wondering when you talk there about bringing the EU citizens into decision making, and I'm accepting what you said about democracy being thinner at the EU level, I wonder really how involved citizens are in many countries at national level in shaping the political decisions between elections. Pascal Lamy uh, wrote this weekend an article where he said the citizen is not just an occasional voter, but in many countries it almost is like that. But I wanted to ask another question about bringing the citizens in, because there's been a lot of talk, and, and Dominic made reference uh, at the beginning to the lack of journalists covering the conference on the future of Europe, lack of coverage of what's been happening. A lot of concern that, that actually the process is only reaching a tiny proportion of the EU population. Herman, if this conference is to play a valuable role in the ways you've described, is it a problem that it doesn't appear yet to have got that outreach, uh, going to the parts that we don't normally reach, going really beyond the Brussels bubble in a meaningful sense, beyond the 200 citizens who sat in the room uh, at each of the last two weeks. Is, is this an issue? Because it could be an issue then for the legitimacy of whatever those citizens' panels come up with. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's say that uh, the aim of the conference shouldn't be uh, to organize mass events uh, with with thousands of people, and 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 then you you will get uh, you will get journalists. Eh? Um, so what what they are doing, for me, it's quite intelligent, eh? uh, bringing people together from all over Europe, uh, but people representative for all sensitivities in the European Union, and having a conversation among them. You, you don't need 2,000 people uh, to, to have a good discussion you, with, with 200 people, but as I say, representing all the different sensitivities in Europe, uh, then, then uh, you, can, you can have something productive. Huh? Uh, so for me, it's, it's in, in some way the, the, the right way to do. Uh, of course, all depends on, on how this uh, conversation is, is conducted and, and what, what, what the final results are. Uh, but I have no, no objections uh, against the, the method that, uh, that is used. For me, the, one of the interesting outcomes would be uh, to see what the agenda, political agenda, of those 200 or 300 people is. What is high on the agenda? Is it, I give you an example, is it migration? And if it is migration, is the emphasis on protecting our borders or solidarity? Uh, you have not to go to enter into details, uh, but, but see, what, 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 what do they have in mind? Mm -hmm. Is it a strategic autonomy? That's a concept uh, among leaders, but is it also a concept among citizens, and if it is strategic autonomy, in what kind of areas? China, the United States, defense, and so on. Uh, the rule of law uh, is one of the issues. Apparently, it is already discussed. Uh, how far uh, can we go to put pressure on those countries that are not complying with what we consider as European values? So for me, that, this kind of, of meetings can be interesting, not in elaborating on what should be climate change policies, that, that, that's not their business, but what is the 
what are the priorities what what is the for them the political agenda and then leaders have to to listen and to to respond to their to those worries to those concerns thank you uh, dominic you wanted to come in bridget i'll just let dominic react quickly and then i'll come to you on that question dominic Yes, but because I want to fully support Herman in, in what he's saying, because there is a misunderstanding when it comes to citizens assemblies uh, within, in, in this context that I hear a lot of people saying citizens should come up with new ideas that that have never been discussed before on the EU level, things like that. I mean, they will develop new ideas, but of course, most ideas will have been discussed already in the EU. But the interesting thing is really to compare what is actually going on currently in the EU and what citizens have in mind to, to do a comparison, to do a matching exercise. And then we should leave all the kinds of competencies questions just, just uh, in front of the door. It's not about that. If citizens think, health and education should also be dealt on on the european level so let them say so and then we've got to deal with the results so it's not about super surprising ideas but it is especially with these really broad topics for for the citizens panels it is a bit of a matching ex exercise thank you bridget on this question of of Helman really saying if you've got if you've carefully selected your citizens you've got that representativity in terms of the different views and so on it's not it's not about the numbers uh, and therefore it doesn't need to delegitimize the process but I'm still forgive me for being cynical seeing an, a way in which EU leaders can say at the end yes well that was all very well and good but it didn't really reach the hearts and minds we didn't have the great public debate on the future of the EU that that the conference set out so we can ignore the results. Do you have that concern or would you agree with Herman? It doesn't matter so much. So I, I think the citizens assemblies or the citizens panels, as they're called, is a really important and innovative and experimental element to this conference on the future of Europe. It is it could well become a more prominent feature in the future if there's proof of concept. So the first role the citizens panels will play is proof of concept. What level of deliberation do you get? Secondly, I think these sorts of deliberative fora and debates are the best antidote to populism. Because what is the politics of populism? The politics of populism is simplism. You can have it all. There are no choices. The world would be a wonderful place if we were governed by anyone other than the so-called elite. Whereas deliberation requires a discussion of trade-offs and of problems. And so I think the deliberative process itself is very important. And I fully agree with Herman and with Dominic that it'll be interesting to see what surfaces, what, what, what's given prominence in, in the deliberative process. Uh, and I think also we shouldn't underestimate uh, the fact that citizens themselves, small in number, who participate in such processes, they actually gain a sense of political efficacy. They gain a sense of political ownership. So I think that is, for me, uh, given all of the background interinstitutional noise that took place and problems around this conference, I think this is both hopeful uh, and very useful. And it's not that it replaces representative democracy. It is simply another element of a democratic fabric. And democracy needs all of the, the these textures uh, to improve the quality uh, of democracy. And also, I think the issues facing Europe are very, very big, as we know. And therefore, there might also be a pedagogical element to this, almost a teaching element. Uh, sense of what are the issues that we now need to confront and if for example we simply take climate well that's transformative and the trade-offs are very tough thank you very much um Yanis just just to this point lots of questions coming in we'll come to them in a moment uh but from your perspective uh would you do you agree we shouldn't worry so much about the numbers game how many people it's reaching and so on or do we need and can we do more? Can the Commission do more? Can the Parliament do more? Can member states do more? And how do we convince them to do it to really engage a wider public in this? Yes, they could do more. And yes, they should do more. There is no awareness for the conference. If you ask people around yourself, your relatives, your friends, 
those not nerds dealing with EU affairs about the conference, they will tell you, I haven't heard of it. Sorry. Um, and even what Dominic was describing earlier, um, journalists are not reporting about it. They haven't really reported strongly about the first, first sessions which have happened with respect to the European citizens panels. And I think that this is actually a problem. Um, and it is a problem also because those who actually want to drown the conference into something which at the end of the day will deliver nothing, do exactly want that. They do not want people to know of the conference. They do not want to know of what is happening in these deliberations. They have an interest to downplay the conference because they do not want the conference to make a difference. And there's another group, and there's an unholy alliance here who are afraid, who are afraid that we will raise expectations which the conference or the EU will not be able to deliver. So let's downplay the conference in order for it not to play a role. I think this is the wrong way to go with respect to the current conference, but also with respect to what comes after this conference in terms of deliberative democracy in future similar exercises. Um, because I think what is important, and that's why we need to link the citizens dimension and the representative dimension of what we call the Conference on the Future of Europe. It is all good that we're having 200 citizens in four citizens panels, so 800 in total deliberating. That's how we sh it should be. It's not about having a thousand people yeah. coming together and discuss. It's not a festival uh, of democracy. There is a deliberative process which is thought through, which we hadn't had in the past. So the pool of the concept, the proof of the concept, as Bridget, you called it, I think will be a positive one when it comes to how these citizens panels have been organized. Can they be better? Yes, they can be better. But the proof of the concept of the conference on the future of Europe, of the future of Europe is about the output and the impact it will have. And that is the big question mark. And if you want to have output and impact, you need to have a pressure coming from the conference. If you remember uh, in uh, the first uh, COCO we had with Guy Verhofstadt, he was using these words. I'm talking about the pressure function. He uses other words, but there needs to be come pressure out of the conference with respect to outcome and impact at the European level. And if you have nobody being aware of it, you have a problem. Absolutely. The biggest problem is how you move from the citizens outcomes, which I'm rather confident that we will have a rather clear picture to something which will come out of the conference proper, which is more than the citizens dimension. It also includes the representative dimension. This is one where the could, crux of come the back matter to that comes. Output and so on. But Dominic, a quick question to you, and then I'm gonna take a few uh, from the audience. And it links, you said at the beginning, that we've seen that the process works. So in a sense, we have that proof of concept that Bridget is talking about. Tweaks, yes, maybe things changing. But in terms of this, uh, and I'm not really talking now about the numbers at, on the panels, but if you look at the multilingual digital platform, you look at the other methods of outreach, a lot of people pointing to uh, the, what they say is a tiny proportion of the public. Are you concerned about that? Or do you agree with the others that, or, or certainly with Herman and Bridget, this is not such a big issue. Yanis, I think more saying, <laughs> if we're not talking about it, we're not gonna care about the result and then it will have been meaningless. Uh, no, I am. I'm absolutely concerned about that. I fully agree with Bridget when it comes to the concept, and then then it could be useful for the European Union and an interesting, um, interesting enlargement of tools. Uh, let's say, but uh, I mean, when a tweet, let's say, from a co-chair of the conference, you know, in another matter, so a co-chair who's close up to 500, uh, 500 followers on, on, on Twitter. When such a tweet generates more likes than any proposal on the platform, so then there is a problem, I think. So citizens in Europe do not know what is actually going on. And uh, so this is exactly what, what Yanis is saying. So the conference faces a kind of dilemma. On the one hand, it is an experiment, and we're trying something, some, something out. So a deliberative dem democracy on the European level. But on the other hand, the conference needs to produce tangible results. And of course, when I spoke to citizens in Strasbourg, they loved the first days in Strasbourg, but they also made very clear that they want to see results at the end of the day. And they want to know how their ideas influenced at least the discussions of, Europe, of, of European policy makers. So, and here, going back to the, 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 the concept of experiment, I mean, experiment is open, yeah, the result is open, but it needs to be set up in the right way and it needs to be supported by all. And when I look at the supporter list of the conference, well, it didn't get bigger. Yeah. So, yeah, at least, yeah. so it's very much up to the French presidency as well, I think, to revive the process and to really make clear that there needs to be, that there needs to be tangible results. 
Okay, on this point of tangible results, Victoria Palatai from the audience says, just to say that, echoing very much what you just said, Dominic, at the end of the last citizens panel last weekend, several participants were saying they hope there will be a more concrete output Put, and that their efforts will not be made in vain. And Ralph Drakenberg says, regarding the consequences of the conference, what can we expect from the European Council? The leader's agenda foresees a discussion for March 2022. Will they really, the heads of state and government, support the outcomes of the conference and agree to reforms or ignore them? What would that mean for democracy? So Bridget, you raised this point about participants gaining a sense of political ownership, which is very valuable, but not if at the end of it, they feel twas for nothing. Uh, how concerned are you? What would, what would turn the potential of this conference into a bad outcome from that point of view? How can we make sure they don't go away feeling actually more disillusioned than ever? So I have, I have a real concern about how the various elements or segments of this conference will meld in the end and what the output and outcome will be. Why? Because I think we're also in a period of political volatility, new German government coming in, and remember that the French presidency is all very well, but the French president will be facing a very tough election, as Herman already uh, pointed out. So it may be that, in fact, the output and outcome may need more time than the kinds of deadlines that we're now that we're now talking about. And a lot will depend on firstly what the combined recommendations are and how they meld with the strategic agendas that are already there. And then what the political conclusions are, because of course it will all end up in the European Council at some stage. And uh, I have deep concerns as to what will happen, but I think none of us know because we're in a period of a uh, transition in terms of political leadership in major EU countries. Mm, indeed, uh, Herman, your thoughts on that, and of course with the German election results and the prospect of, of long uncertainty, the French presidential election coming up, the politics of all of this, this is, it was seen as a window of opportunity to do it now, um, but it could all become completely enmeshed in those processes. How concerned are you about the, the risk of raised expectations that are dashed? Yeah. Um... I'm in a different mood. I have no high expectations, so I cannot be easily <laughs> disappointed. Uh, let's not forget that uh, normally the, the conference should have started much earlier. Huh? But due to COVID and then that ridiculous debate about who, is who would chair the, the, the conference, we, we lost time. But COVID was... Uh, was uh, was also disrupting, let's say, the normal process of, of the conference. Right? Uh, all with, I think, the public attention and the attention of the attention of the traditional media uh, will be there once the, we have recommendations and and there is a deliberation or the discussion uh, among the, the 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 Commission, the the, the Council. And, uh, and the representatives of the of the parliament. When this political discussion is really starting, you will you will have uh, sufficient attention. It's absolutely normal that traditional media uh, are not interested in a, in a discussion among two hundred people with, without clear conclusions. Uh, they, they are always interested in let's say the the political debate and the tensions, especially the tensions uh, in that kind of political debate. So. Be not too impatient. You you will have you will have your uh, your sufficient uh, political attention or audience at at some time in the in the process. Of course, the 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 macro political circumstances are not ideal. Uh, with a, hopefully a new German government and the end uh, of the, the the current presidency. In, uh, in 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 France, that's not uh, the, the the right moment. Uh, but for me, the conference will not end in May uh, twenty uh, twenty two. The, the the conference is not an eternal process, uh, but it is clear that we cannot come to real conclusions already in May. Of course, there will be a a. a, a some kind of ceremony organized by President Macron in the framework of his election campaign. 
But for me, it has to go beyond, uh, let's say, the spring of, uh, of, of next year before the, 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 the real debate can start uh, about uh, the, the, the recommendations. And then you have a, a normal German government in place. You have a new French presidency or an old one, but with a new mandate and so on. So for me, the deadline is not May. Uh, that underlines that my expectations are different from, uh, from others. Uh, I'm not expecting quick results. Uh, and uh, I'm not expecting that we the conference will end already uh, in the uh, in the mid of next year. Thank you. So, okay, we talked about the conference itself. I want to turn in our last remaining 15 minutes more to the future uh, and what this could mean. And going back to uh, what Bridget was saying about that proof of concept and so on. A question from our audience, Marie-Hélène Calliol says, shouldn't the Conference on the Future of Europe have in the back of its mind to become Europe's future democratic platform, some kind of third chamber of the European Parliament, uh, likely to embark citizens in the decision-making system on a permanent basis, so much needed, she says, and technically possible in the 21st century. So what is uh, the future place uh, of this? If, if, as we're saying, the process works, the proof of concept is there with that huge caveat of delivery, it will be the ultimate proof of concept. Um, how do you see its role in the future? Could we have this happen on a permanent basis? Um, Bridget? So uh, I hesitate about further complicating the EU's institutional framework and makeup. It's already a very complex uh, institutional multi-level system. But one could be extremely radical and say that the parliament is the representative in, in, for the citizens, the European Council for the states. And one might think about uh, abolishing or abandoning the Committee of the Regions and the Economic and Social Committee and replacing it with some sort of citizens platform, assembly or whatever. But I wouldn't add without taking something away. Thank you. And interesting, you say mentioned the regions there because Marta Marin from the audience says regions and in particular constitutional regions see a worrying trend of centralization due to the, the shake. I'm not sure shake up I think, of execution, simplification of many EU policies and so on. Do you think the EU should be more aware of this issue and that the time has come to put this issue on the table to ensure real transformative policies and democratic outwards? Herman, Complicating the system if we make this some sort of permanent mechanism, need to take something away if we add it, or is this the wrong way to be looking at the future of these types of processes? And then, Yanis. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, the, the system is already complicated, but it is also complicated at, uh, at the level of the nation states. Uh, look at the Netherlands, they try to form a government that will take, they will be close to the Belgian record. And so it, it's complicated at all, all levels of power, not only, uh, let's say, at the level of institutions, and I fully agree with, uh, with Brigitte, uh, but also in the, in, uh, as, as far as the functioning of the institutions are concerned. For me, the, the, the participatory element in, uh, in democracy, again, at all levels of power, is an interesting dimension, a new dimension of the functioning of our democracies. Um, you shouldn't add a new institution, but you should add new processes. Right? Uh, even at the local and the regional level, you need uh, much more feedback from citizens than today. Of course, the, the final say is for those who are elected. And by the way, we have one million elected people at regional and local level. So there's a lot of people, but it, still, even with this one million, there is some kind of alienation of, 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 of voters. That's the feeling also uh, in, 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 in most of our countries, if not all of our countries. So introducing processes of deliberation and participatory democracy at all levels of power, for me, that's something that we have really to consider. And for me, it can be an outcome of the conference without going into the details how to organize it because it depends from country to country. And at the European level, you can have something something similar. 
uh, not as a new institution, but on a regular basis, on an annual basis or biannual basis, a process where you consent, consult uh, citizens saying, hey, do we have the right agenda? Uh, are we on the right track? Uh, and I mentioned uh, migration, I mentioned strategic autonomy, the rule of law, you can add health and, 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 and other topics. So that, that, you, you, that those who are elected can confront their agenda with but what the, the mainstream is of the agenda of citizens. And that you can organize on, a, let's say, a, a regular or a semi-regular basis. For me, it's not an institution. It's some kind of a process. Mm, thank you. Yanis, you wanted to come in and then Dominic on this point. Well, first of all, if you look into EU policymaking, we already have different participatory uh, instruments. And um, so... It, we already have a plethora of ways in which we can involve citizens in EU policymaking, whether successful, whether being noticed or not. So for me, the conference adds another element to that, maybe still real missing infrastructure, but still it's another element of participation. Um, but for me, and that's one of the lessons which you can already draw from the beginnings of the conference, and we were discussing that already before it started, was that the most value can come from these processes if you have concrete topics and questions which you address. So mm -hmm. for me, when we get to a point where we have a topic which we consider to be of a certain significance, and we also want to have results at the European level and are unable to get to them, asking citizens in future, in future, hopefully again, we will not call it conferences, in future processes of the same sort with concrete issues, concrete question, in here, the representative dimension of the conference, the, the member states, the parliamentarians shied away or were not able to actually deliver on what concrete issues and questions they should, the conference should be addressing. They left it open. And I think in future, we should learn from that. So there's room for these kind of processes, but we need to adapt them, make them more concrete so that they could deal with concrete issues. Just one remark with respect to the politics of it, because I wasn't able to, um, to say something earlier when it came to that. One is, we do not know how strong the French and the French presidency will be supporting the conference. That is a, still a question. Question. Second point, um, with respect to Hammond's point, don't worry, attention will be there with respect to the conference when we get to the moment where it will become more concrete. I think attention will also come when people will realize that the problems which you're facing now in the conference have a lot to do with the different constituencies of the conference. Mm. The Council of the Member States, the European Parliament, uh, national parliamentarians, pushing in very different direction. And it's not that these institutions are black boxes. There are, you have to open the Council and see the differences between member states. The French have treated the conference differently. In the Parliament, there are different positions. And this is showing itself in the structures of the conference already, in the Executive Board, in the Secretariat. And that will become more clear, clearer as we progress in the process. And I think that potentially could lead to attention, not because of the policy differences, but how we actually deal with when we listen or not listen so, to citizens. So extrapolating from that, when journalists do turn their attention to it, it might not be the sort of attention that will necessarily give this process a very good press. And I would agree. But that's, rea I, that's reflecting realities as they are indeed. currently in the European Union. Speaking with my journalist hat on, it is true. Journalists are not interested in process. They are interested in outcomes and they're deeply interested in political tensions. So I think you will see a lot more interest later if that cheers you up at all, Dominic. But in terms of the future and whether this becomes some sort of ad hoc but regular um, practice or it becomes something more permanent, that suggestion of a third chamber of the European Parliament, how do you see it becoming part of the process? In what way would be most useful and, uh, and address the issues we've been discussing most effectively. Well, I think, uh, Bridget, she's placed a kind of bump somewhere in Brussels. So if you want to abolish <laughs> two committees, two advisory committees, you, you would surely get the media attention that I'm craving for, for, for the conference. <laughs> so, but, but overall, I think we've got to keep in mind. So as I said, it's an exper experiment. We do it for the first time. This will not 
this will not change the democratic setup of the EU from the day to tomorrow. Yeah, and there is already, as as Janis men mentioned, a plethora of instruments, a patchwork of participation instruments. Uh, so, but there is no real strategy for citizens' participation on on the European level, and that is what is missing. And when I look at the instruments, then we can clearly say that. There is this multilingual digital platform. So far, it doesn't work that well. But of course, it can be connected in future to normal online consultation processes. We've got the panels. And it's an interesting element. And it's, a, it's also culturally interesting, as Bridget said. And it is, and it is I mean, it is truly European to bring together that many citizens from different member states. And that, that in itself uh, is interesting. But when I look at the national level, of course, I see a kind of deliberative wave rolling through Europe. But the question how to connect these citizens elements, uh, these citizens uh, assemblies, these new forms of citizens participation to the representative system, this is still a question to be answered. And it is a very tricky question on the European level. So what topics, who is instigating the whole process, what to do with the results, how to connect the various discussions with each other. We are, we're just at a starting point, I think, with regard to these questions. Overall, still, I believe it could be interesting with regard to treaty change. I'm not saying this is up to the citizens to decide, but it could start with a citizens assembly, things like that. And the other level is, of course, the normal, the normal agenda setting process and the kind of comparison of what citizens think with regard to some areas and some subjects uh, and what is going on in Brussels. And here, of course, that could be an interesting new tool. Absolutely. And all things we'll come back to in future convents conversations uh, in more detail. Uh, but before we close, and we are almost out of time, I wanted to ask each of you, and Bridget, I'll come to you and then I'll give Herman the last word. I'm not going to ask Yanis and Dominic because I've asked them this question before, but it's a question I ask all our guests on conference conversations. Uh, and it relates to something that the Commission Vice President and Conference Co-Chair Dubravka Switcher said in March, right at the beginning of the process. She said, the conference will enable citizens from every corner of the EU and from all backgrounds to share their ideas, hopes, and dreams in shaping the union's future. As citizens now, taking off your institutional or other hats, as a citizen, Bridget, what is your dream outcome for the conference, the one thing you hope it will achieve above all else? That it will contribute to Europe being more capable of managing the immense challenges and transformations that it is currently in. So capacity building, really focusing on that and then the delivery. Herman, for you, your dream outcome? My dream outcome is that uh, citizens in some way can contribute to the formulation of the strategic agenda of the European Union. And I have a former politician, uh, and the question often is, we have our own agenda, but is this the agenda of a majority of citizens? And often we are in our own bubble with our own logic, uh, our own uh, rivalries, and it happens, and it happens too often that we are disconnected from mainstream tendencies in society. So how to connect or re reconnect and, and how can a, a process adjust uh, the, this, uh, this, this cleavage? Um, and, and for me, that, that could be an outcome uh, for, uh, for, the, for, for the conference. Uh, uh, what, what can, can citizens contribute uh, to, uh, to, to formulate a strategic agenda for the union. And then it's up to the institutions to, to implement this. Of course, after having listened and after drawing their own conclusions. Eh? But this could be something interesting, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. We are out of time. Thank you to all of you for a great discussion. Thank you, audience, for your comments and questions. I couldn't read them all out. There were too many and some were just too long, uh, but I, I managed to squeeze in a few. Uh, it only remains for me to tell you a little bit about what happens next. So our next conference conversations will be on October the 18th. Watch this space for the invitation and the agenda. In the meantime, please do follow the observatory on Twitter to be kept constantly informed 
told about his activities, get updates. As I mentioned, please take a look at that paper uh, that was published by the EPC with some first reflections on the panels. Our observatory members, Dominic was there, they're watching every twist and turn and they will bring their analysis to you and their assessment of those developments. And finally, in the spirit of participatory democracy that lies at the heart of this conference and we've been talking about for the last hour, as many of you who've been with us before will know, we like to extend that to conference conversations. We like to hear from you what you think we should be talking about in future conversations. So as we end this session, a little box will pop up. And if you want to make suggestions for questions you'd like to be addressed at future conference conversations, that is your chance. Please uh, take advantage of it. Thank you again, panel, for a great discussion, and most particularly uh, to Herman and to Bridget. We're so grateful for your time and for your role as co-chairs of the High Level Advisory Group. It is tremendous to have your support. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day. Goodbye. <laughs>